Welcome to the lecture for week 7 in abnormal psychology. Uh, this lecture will be on trauma and stressor related disorders. And just a quick reminder, uh, make sure to go on to Moodle and watch the other videos that have been uploaded there. Uh, both of them about PTSD, how we understand it, and also how we treat it. Uh, both of those coming to us from uh, the VA system. One other reminder too, uh, your first book report is due uh, on May 2nd. Um, so make sure that uh, um, you have a book that you've uh, read and are writing a short uh, paper on uh, things you've gained from that book. Short paper, uh, just really to demonstrate kind of what you've taken away from that book. All right. Uh, as we talk about trauma and stressor related disorders, uh, there are five different disorders that are actually in this category. We're going to only focus on the first three uh, disorders in this category uh, and really focus only on a lot of time on adjustment disorders and post traumatic stress disorders. I want to quickly mention uh, the bottom two disorders though and kind of give you a review of what they're about. Both of these disorders uh, are childhood disorders, uh, things that are seen in children. They are grouped within this area of trauma and stressor related disorders because both of them have the same component that a child has to have experienced a social uh, situation, a, a caregiving situation that is extreme. Either extreme because uh, they've experienced neglect in that situation, so uh, their caregiver not providing to their uh, basic emotional or physical needs, or with both of these disorders, a social situation where there's a frequent repeated changes in their caregivers. In addition to having these caregiver situations that are characterized by changes or neglect, um, they have to have a, some type of response to it. And that's where these two disorders differ is in how they respond to it. So the first one, reactive attachment disorder. This is when the child, because of those either changes or neglect in their caregiving environment, they uh, fail to seek out any type of caregiving from adults. They're inhibited or withdrawn from that. Um, and so the child rarely or minimally ever seeks out comfort uh, when they're distressed or if comfort is provided to them from their caregiver or any other adult, they rarely ever respond to that comfort. And they have a lack of kind of uh, minimal social, social or emotional responses to others in general and really a lack of kind of positive emotions uh, that are displayed. At times, though, they will have unexplained kind of irritability or sadness or fearfulness, uh, even when they're not in a threatening situation. And it makes sense for this disorder. Here, the caregivers are a source of kind of abuse or neglect or changing. And so the child really fails to uh, see others as being able to comfort them and meet their emotional needs. And so as a result, they don't turn to others or they don't respond to others when that comfort is provided. Um, and they, uh, when the caregivers are kind of seen as uh, the kind of, they should be seen as the stability in a child's world. If a child doesn't have that stability there, uh, in general, the world can seem more chaotic. Uh, and so that's why we see kind of the ups and downs with irritability or sadness or uh, fearfulness, even when the situation kind of doesn't warrant it. So the second one, again, we have the same kind of criteria that there has to be some type of social neglect, 
uh, or changes in the caregivers, some type of problem there. But this one, uh, for this disorder, rather than withdrawing, the children are overly involved uh, with caregivers. And it's not with just with their, their particular caregivers, but they get overly involved, overly engaged with any adults. So they have no worry, no fear about approaching new adults, unfamiliar adults. Uh, they get overly familiar in terms of verbal or physical behavior uh, uh, with any adults. Um, and they don't ever look back to their caregivers, you know, when engaging with new adults to uh, check to make sure that they're safe or check to see. Uh, but they're just willing to go off with any unfamiliar adult with no hesitation at all. And again, this it, it can't be, it has to be out of line with kind of their developmental level and out of line with cultural norms. Some cultures, more adults are involved in the caregiving, and so there would be less hesitancy there. But um, uh, yeah, with this one, we see that when they should be afraid of others or they should be hesitant, they're not hesitant at all. And again, both of these tied back to the caregiving situation. The caregivers are uh, either neglectful, so the child learns that uh, they can't trust those caregivers or uh, they shouldn't trust them, and so they either don't trust anyone else or they overly trust everyone else. Okay, for the rest of the time though today, we're gonna, like I said, focus on the three other disorders here, which are more common seen in adults. And similar to the other lectures that we've done, talking about the what, the why and the how for those disorders. So let's start with adjustment disorder. So adjustment disorder used to be in its own category. It used to be kind of a catch-all disorder that if an individual didn't meet criteria for major depressive disorder or meet criteria for an anxiety disorder or something like that, uh, the psychologist psychologist or uh, other provider would give them a, a diagnosis of adjustment disorder, recognizing that there's something wrong, something going on, but it doesn't fit into cleanly into another category. Now though, with the most recent DSM, it's been grouped with the trauma and stressor related disorders, really saying that it's not just uh, things that don't fit in other places, but there has to be a cause or a source uh, to the difficulties that the individual is having. And so uh, for this disorder, the individual develops emotional or behavioral symptoms uh, in response to an identifiable stressor. So these symptoms have to start or begin within onset, uh, within three months of when the stressor began. And it doesn't say exactly what the emotional or behavioral symptoms are. Uh, it could be depression, it could be anxiety, it could be other responses, but there has to be something uh, that's impairing or causing problems uh, uh, with their responses. So it could be impairing it because it's, the distress is out of proportion to what the stressor uh, should be, uh, the response to the stressor should be, or it causes impairment in some areas of their functioning. So this is what we see for you know individuals who have difficulty adjusting to um, starting college or individuals who have difficulty uh, moving schools or moving homes as they were growing up, uh, or when there's a divorce and children have difficulty adjusting or transitioning to that. Typically, this disorder, uh, once the stressor is over, if it's not an ongoing stressor, uh, it kind of alleviates itself within a six month period. It could last longer, but typically uh, it's over within that kind of time range. And it's important here that it can't meet criteria for another disorder. So if an individual, uh, say, uh, gets fired from a job 
and at first that individual is kind of having difficulty coping with that having a hard time kind of figuring it out and figuring out their purpose in life after that if at any point it turns into depression and the individual meets criteria for a full depressive episode it's no longer adjustment disorder now that individual has major depressive disorder So like I mentioned, uh, the picture of the behaviors and emotions can fit with other categories. Most common, it fits with depression, and we can specify that it's with depressed mood, or anxiety, or a mixture of two, the two. Now in children, uh, we often see conduct problems come up as well, where they're acting out more uh, and so we can specify that as well. This is one of the most common diagnoses. 20% uh, of the individuals who see are seeking mental health treatment in outpatient clinics get this diagnosis, and 50% in hospital settings. And you think about it in the hospital settings where an individual might also uh, be experiencing cancer or might have had major health challenges uh, that of course they would have difficulty adjusting to some of those major things. Some of the common stressors here are loss of romantic relationships, loss of a job, starting college is a big one, uh, increased work demands, getting married, and retirement. Uh, some of these are very positive things. Um, it, the stressor doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's just difficulty adjusting to the change. Uh, that can be hard even, even when it's very positive and you're happy about the change that's occurred. And typically the duration of this disorder depends a little bit on the duration of the event. If it's an acute event, usually it's a briefer duration. If somebody gets fired from their job kind of out of the blue all of a sudden, uh, the duration of the disorder is also typically a little quicker. But if something is prolonged out, uh, oftentimes that leads to a longer experience of the problems. We often think about adjustment disorder just in terms of coping resources uh, compared to stressors. So all of us have certain coping resources that are typically effective in our lives, um, but when we face some type of extra stressor or several extra stressors or a huge stressor, that our coping s skills, uh, we may find that they don't, they're not uh, adequate to meet those stressors. And so uh, we have then difficulty then adjusting to them. And oftentimes this difficulty, initial difficulty adjusting, can lead to experiences of demoralization, kind of a loss of hope, uh, kind of giving your hands up and uh, being unreally sure what direction to move forward in. So that really ties into the treatment then. Uh, the kind of best or one of the simplest treatments for an adjustment disorder is solution-focused therapy. Remember I said the individual has coping strategies but they find that they're just not meeting uh, the stressors or the problems that they're asked to face now. So the idea with solution-focused therapy is just to get the individual to use the resources that they already have uh, to face their new problems, either helping them figure out how they would apply to the new problems, or just reminding them again of, of what resources they have available to them. Solution-focused therapy focuses a lot on the strengths rather than the problems, and uh, what people do, and what they can do, rather than an illness uh, that they might have. So a couple simple stages, usually solution-focused therapy is done in just one or two sessions. The beginning question is uh, uh, a kind of a brainstorming uh, segment of the session where the individual starts to think about uh, their resources again. And a few ways that you get the individual to think about it is uh, one, something they call the miracle question. 
So if all of a sudden the problem was taken away, or if they had complete control, you know, they had a grasp on this problem, this challenge that they're facing, and they were to see themselves, what would they be doing that would show that they have the grasp on it? And then uh, they'll give ideas of what it would look like for them. Again, focused on their behavior uh, and having them talk about that. A second way in getting them to think about this is the scaling question. With any kind of problems, uh, the individual is going to have fluctuation in how they're doing handling it. And so you have them think about times when they're handling it well compared to times when they're not handling it so well. And just think about, well, what's the difference? What are they actually doing different? Not how is the problem different or what others around them are doing different, but what are they actually doing different when they're handling it better? And then finally is search for exceptions. Uh, the problem and their difficulty with those problems is not a ongoing always been there, always will be there type of thing. And so you have them think about a pastime when they were coping with relatively well with the stressor, or a time when they uh, seem to be having no problems with this stressor at all, and ask them what were they doing during those times. For all of these questions, you're focused on them, the individual, and what they were doing. And once you get an idea of that, then you move on to the second stage of assigning tasks. And those tasks are do more of it, do more of the things that they were doing in the past that worked well, or spend some time and figure out how to do it. Uh, talk with others who are doing it well, or um, uh, do some research, you know, uh, study it out, but just make a plan. Uh, for something that they want to try. And then finally, as they get that plan down, uh, doing a small piece of it at a time. Don't have them tackle the whole thing all at once, but a small piece and get success in doing that, and then you can move on to the next small piece and so on. The final kind of stage in this is just a follow-up. Like I said, this is one, two, three sessions maybe. Uh, perhaps in the first session, setting the goals and assigning the tasks that the individual is going to do, and then following up in a month or a week and seeing how did that all work out. And if it didn't work out, then kind of going back, coming up with some more ideas, assigning more tasks, uh, coming up with a new plan, and testing that out. Uh, yeah, so you can see kind of by the name, really solution focused to it. Now, solution-focused therapy is, is great when we're talking about something like adjustment disorders where uh, the individual has a lot of coping skills and a lot of resources available to them. They just don't know how to apply it to the situation. But solution-focused therapy does fall short for uh, other disorders where it's, it's not necessarily um, uh, as easy of a solution. Post-traumatic stress disorder would be one of those other disorders. So post-traumatic stress disorder is actually a very complicated disorder uh, with several different criteria to it. So we're going to break this down over the next few slides, uh, uh, the various criteria uh, for, for this disorder. The first criteria has to do with an event that's happened. So for post-traumatic stress disorder, the individual has to have been ex uh, exposed to an event where they were threatened in some way. That threatened could be death. They could have possibly died or thought they could have possibly died. Or serious injury. Um, it could also be sexual violence. Or finally, uh, some uh, threat to their identity, who they are as an individual. And that might be directly experiencing the event themselves, or it could be witnessing the event occurring to others, or learning about the event occurring to close family members or close friends, or finally it could be ex uh, experiencing repeated exposure 
into the verse details of the event of others. This is what we often see with kind of first responders, uh, police officers, firefighters, even psychologists, where they repeatedly see others exposed to traumatic events or uh, things happening or hear about it, uh, hear the stories of it, and that can cause the PTSD for, for themselves. Okay, so that's the first set. The second set uh, is after the exposure to the event, what has to happen? And here with criteria B, we're talking about intrusive symptoms related to the traumatic events. So things that start to happen, once the individual is safe, but it feels like the symptoms and the things are happening over and over again to them. And so it could be the memories that keep on coming back to them and they can't, they can't get rid of them. They can't think about other things, but they just keep coming back. Could be through dreams. It could also be through kind of uh, flashbacks where the individual uh, isn't just having a memory, but feels like uh, they're in the, the events occurring again. They're in that situation again. Or it could be just intense distress when they're exposed to cues of the event. So maybe it sounds, maybe it sights, maybe it smells, something that reminds them of the trauma that they were exposed to. And in addition to the distress, a psych physiological reaction, um, the nervousness and how that shows up in their body associated with uh, those cues of the event. third area, criteria area, criteria C, is avoidance. So they have the event, and then they have intrusions where lots of these feelings, emotions, memories, flashbacks are coming back to them over and over. And then in this category, they start to avoid any of those uh, things that would cause more distress or flashbacks, things like that. So they try to avoid the memories, they try to avoid the thoughts, they try to avoid the feelings all associated with that trauma. Or they try to avoid the situations associated with the trauma. So people, places, objects, activities, anything that would serve as a cue uh, to remind them of that trauma. The final uh, kind of uh, main category, um, sorry, two others with this, but uh, so one other one is the negative alterations in their thoughts and moods. Um, and so uh, they may kind of um, disso have dissociated, um, kind of have some type of amnesia related to that event. They may develop these negative thoughts or beliefs about self and others related to the events, uh, or have beliefs about why the event happened to them uh, that are uh, not accurate, that are distorted out of reality. And they feel kind of because of all these things, uh, they don't want to engage in the world as much with others or activities or anything uh, positive they try to avoid. Okay, then the final kind of main category is uh, uh, changes their arousal or their reactivity physically uh, and how they respond to situations. And so typically with PTSD, we'll see increased kind of irritability, anger outbursts, maybe reckless behavior, uh, we often see hypervigilance, kind of watching out, seeing if the trauma could happen again. And with that hypervigilance, if there's any type of cue or trigger, kind of a startle response, um, and then because of all of this arousal all the time, then problems concentrating on what they need to and uh, problems sleeping at night. With all of these things, uh, the duration of the symptoms has to be greater than one month. So they could start right away as soon as the uh, trauma happened and last for a month or more. And as soon as it hits a month mark, the individual will get a diagnosis of PTSD. 
or there could be a delayed onset where maybe the trauma happened and they're able to cope in the short term with the trauma, but as it all kind of seeks in um, and they think more about uh, the events that happened, and then the symptoms can start. Once the symptoms start, they have to be present for a month before the diagnosis can be given. It's estimated that 8 to 10 percent of adults at some point will experience PTSD. Some point they'll experience a trauma and some point will have this type of reaction to it. And within any given year, 3 to 4 percent of adults will have the disorder. Now, that's a, a smaller percentage of the total population, but when we look at individuals who have been exposed to trauma, uh, traumatizing situations, then the percentage is much higher. So of individuals who have been survivors of a rape, uh, about 33 to 50% of those individuals will experience PTSD. Same with those in, who have been in military combat situations, and those who have been exposed to ethnically or politically motivated uh, imprisonment or genocide uh, will experience PTSD. So you see that the trauma is uh, the really important part here. It has to begin with that traumatic event. Onset usually begins within three months. Like I mentioned, it could be right away. It could be after a little bit of time. Typically, it's within the first three months after the trauma, but it can be delayed even longer. Uh, and sometimes uh, I've worked with individuals who uh, had the traumatic event happen in their childhood, but now they were third in their 30s, some in their 40s, sometimes even in their 50s or 60s, and it wasn't until now that the trauma symptoms, the reactions, uh, were starting to show up. And typically, it's associated with a reemergence re of the cues, uh, the threatening things um, from their childhood. It usually doesn't just start to show up again out of the blue after it's been dormant for so long. PTSD used to be classified as another anxiety disorder. And you'll see as we talk about treatments uh, that the treatments are pretty similar. They have a lot of overlap. Uh, but we no longer consider it with the other anxiety disorders. And a couple reasons for that. One is the reactions tend to be a little more extreme with PTSD and the kind of intrusions of it, of the disorder. Second, this disorder usually has a set, very kind of identifiable uh, traumatic event or events that uh, led to it, rather than a series of maybe small things uh, that the individual heard or experienced um, with it. Last, uh, it's such a common disorder and, and we know so much about it that um, we know enough to kind of put it by itself and, and look at it uh, in more detail uh, alone. So there's several different evidence-based treatments for PTSD. The most common of the evidence-based treatments fall within the category of cognitive behavioral treatments. Uh, one cognitive behavioral treatment, and all of these cognitive behavioral treatments uh, uh, work on the principles that we've already talked about with co cognitive behavioral therapies. Uh, the exposure tr principles as well as the uh, cognitive uh, processing the thoughts, um, but they just do it to different degrees. So the first one, prolonged exposure, works primarily on the behavioral component, the exposures. And for prolonged exposure, you have uh, the individual uh, uh, over and over again uh, be exposed to the event. And this often uh, is through imaginal exposures where they're simply talking about the event and they're sharing over and over again what happened. And then eventually into actual exposures of the cues. They're going back into the situation um, uh, where the event happened, the traumatic event or other cues that, that might be present. 
Now, this is a treatment that uh, you need to exercise extreme caution with, that if the individual is exposed to the uh, event in um, not the right way, then it can uh, worsen the PTSD. And so important that only uh, qualified individuals who have training in providing the, this, this treatment uh, really do it with, with clients who are seeking to overcome the disorder. A second and similar one is cognitive processing therapy. This one also works off exposure, um, but focusing on talking through the disorder, so more of the imaginal exposure, talking through kind of the event over and over again. But as they do so, challenging the beliefs about why the trauma occurred and the meaning it now has for the client, um, and really throwing in the heavier kind of cognitive piece. There's also a, a present-centered therapy for this. Um, with present-centered therapy, using some of the same things, same principles, except you're not really talking about the past at all. So clients often like this one because they don't have to relive the trauma, but instead it's just simply focusing on the current symptoms uh, and what's going on and helping them uh, find coping mechanisms for those current symptoms. And then finally, the last one is stress inoculation training. And this is focusing on the coping mechanisms for the stress. And so here, you're teaching them new skills. You're teaching them muscle relaxation, breathing, uh, guided self-dialogue, role-playing, things like that, so that whenever triggers do happen, or cues are present, they have these new coping skills to be able to use, uh, rather than uh, turning to the coping skills that were effective in the time of the trauma. There's one other uh, controversial treatment that does have a lot of a significant amount of research support for it. It's eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy, EMDR. And with this one, uh, the uh, individual is also talking about the trauma and talking about kind of what went, what happened for them. Uh, but while they're doing it, uh, they're asked to move their eyes back and forth from one side to the next. And sometimes the therapist moves his or her fingers back and forth to help the client do this, or other times it's um, through using a light uh, that the client's eyes follow. But it could also be um, uh, auditory, kind of moving back and forth, or physical uh, kind of sensations on different parts of the body. And the idea is, is with this treatment, that when the trauma occurred, the individual was not able to fully process the information from the trauma. So they're kind of stuck there in the brain. And so by having the individual stimulate both sides of their uh, brain, they're able to more fully kind of then process it, uh, the trauma, process kind of the safety that they're now experience uh, and be able to move past it. Being controversial, uh, some psychologists, therapists, um, really feel like the eye movement part and that reprocessing part doesn't really add anything to the uh, just exposure component of the treatment. Uh, and so feel like we're asking clients to do an extra thing that's not really needed or warranted. Finally, uh, oftentimes medications are prescribed uh, when the individual experiences PTSD. Medications uh, uh, can fall both similar to anti-anxiety medications, the benzodiazepines, where it uh, is kind of a tranquilizer, or slows the individual's response system down, relaxes them a little bit, uh, kind of puts them a more kind of even uh, response to their environment, or antidepressants. Last, we have acute stress disorder. I saved this one for last because um, it's similar uh, to PTSD, but it's just different in the timing of it. And so now that we understand PTSD, easy to get this one. This acute stress disorder, uh, the symptoms have to start, so the same PTSD symptoms have to start within one month of the event. 
so there's no waiting on it, but it has to start early, and they can't last longer than one month. So this is often a disorder that eventually leads to PTSD. Uh, um, so if I, say, was in a car accident today, and uh, tomorrow I woke up and I started to have all the PTSD symptoms present, so officially I couldn't get a diagnosis of PTSD until all those symptoms remained present for a month. Instead, my immediate diagnosis is acute stress disorder. And we have this disorder, one, because, you know, if the symptoms are serious, it doesn't make sense to have me wait for an entire month before I get a diagnosis and before I can actually do something about it. But then two, oftentimes how we respond, the way we treat uh, an individual immediately after a stressor is different from the way we would treat an individual several months after a stressor. Immediately after the stressor, it's more focused on safety, making sure the person is safe and making sure that they feel safe in their environment rather than having to kind of go over the, the trauma over and over again uh, to kind of process it in a different way. So thinking about that safety, a uh, commonly used treatment for acute stress disorder is psychological first aid. And psychological first aid has been, it was designed to be able to use it kind of in the moment of a trauma or in the moment of a stressor or immediately after. It's a simple kind of treatment with uh, seven steps. Uh, the first three steps are really about offering support to the individual who just experienced the trauma. You talk to them, you allow them to talk to you about whatever they want. If, if it's the trauma, then that's great, but it doesn't have to be the trauma. Um, but you listen to them and you empathize with them and, and allow them to be heard. And then defining kind of the problem that's there with it um, and the problem from their perspective, really seeing how they experience it and why they're having trouble coping it with it uh, right now and just providing the support for them, uh, hearing them out on it. And then once that's done, really uh, developing a plan, uh, coming up with ideas of how they can now respond now that the trauma's over, things that they can do making a set plan for it, uh, obtaining a commitment that they're going to follow through that with that plan, and then following up with them and making sure they do that. Okay. So again, much more focused on kind of the immediate, what do I do right now, rather than fully kind of processing the, the trauma that occurred and the treatments for PTSD more fully uh, processing what happened and, and disconnecting kind of the reactions that they're having from uh, the cues of, of the trauma. Okay, so code word for this lecture will be acute. Acute, like acute stress disorder, so just make sure that you type that into uh, the Moodle site to get credit for watching this lecture. And that's it for the PTSD and related disorders.